we're going to talk about guarding strategies for bulk conveyors. Um, and I guess I should mention to you that the info that I'm going to share with you today really should not be used as any type of final authority to how your plant or your mine must be guarded. It is tactics and strategies that Martin Engineering has found useful from the research that we've done for our most recent publication, Foundations for Conveyor Safety. A lot of the things that we're going to talk about come from various governing authorities around the globe. Also, it might come from freelance or some independent research uh, that we might have done. And there's really two objectives that we're looking to accomplish today. The first is to hopefully satisfy that varying and very global regulation that you might have to govern your facility on how to guard conveyors. The second objective, and more importantly, is we want to share concepts with you on strategies that we've found that somewhere in the globe, somebody might be doing to guard their conveyors to the gold bar standard. So everything that I'm going to share today, please take as best practices. It may not be a regulation depending on where you're at in the world or what industry you might be working in. However, somebody somewhere in the world is doing it and we've taken it into consideration and felt that it important to relay on to you. So here's what we're going to cover today. First thing we're going to do is going to talk about the hazards of bulk material conveyors. We're going to talk about kind of some studies that we've referred to in the past and some studies that we've done for our publication about what are the most hazardous parts of a conveyor and what people were doing when they got injured. The second thing we'll talk about is some of the best strategies that we found could be useful at your facility to help reduce the risk of workers. Now, when we're finished, there's really three things that you should be able to get out of this. The first, obviously, you should be able to increase worker protection. The second is you should be able to reduce the legal consequences that might accompany an accident at your facility. And third, and this is one that I really think we need to think long and hard about, is I believe, and Martin Engineering believes, that if you guard conveyors better than what you're doing now, you'll have a better chance of attracting and retaining the best and the brightest workforce. One of the biggest problems that we're hearing right now is that mines and process plants are having a big challenge attracting and developing some of the best talent that's out there. So if you're trying to attract, develop, and retain those young, best, and brightest people for your facility, which has an impact on your success, I believe, and Martin Engineering believes, one of the best things that you can do is to show them that they're valued. And one of the ways that you can do that is to make sure your facility is as safe as it can possibly be. So belt conveyors from bulk material handling kind of have some unique hazards compared to other equipment that you might have at your facility. The photo on the left is a coal plant that has excess spillage, and along with that spillage is probably dust. The spillage in particular is found at the tail pulley. Now, in bulk material handling facilities that we're working in, that spillage increases the risk of injury because workers are expected to clean that spillage up. When they're expected and they go to do that work, their rate, their their risk increases, their risk of injury increases because they're put near those rolling components of a conveyor belt, which can cause injury. The photograph on the right is kind of a unique photograph. I wanted to share this with you. Now, this is an after photo. I don't have the before photo, but the before photo is simply the conveyor belt that you see in the right-hand side without any guarding. And I took this picture several years ago at a facility who guarded these conveyors because they had a pretty significant accident. 
what happened is there was a worker who was cleaning up material that had spilled off the conveyor and he was using a hand broom, much like you'd use to sweep up into a dustpan. And he was sweeping that material off the decking of the conveyor belt onto the floor where his partner was coming along with a push broom to get that spilled material off. The worker got this hand broom stuck in the pinch point formed by the troughing idler and the belt. And it pulled that broom in and he didn't let go of that broom before his complete arm was pulled into that pinch point. Now the resulting injury in this instance was the worker had a compound fracture, both bones sticking out of his arm, um, immediately got him to the, to some first aid, got him to the, uh, emergency room and he made a full recovery and he was pretty fortunate in some cases some of the stories that I hear, some of the anecdotes that are shared with me as I'm teaching webinars and teaching classes, is that in some cases, those can be fatal injuries. So it's really important that we kind of do everything we can to reduce this risk. And one of the things that we can do to reduce the risk is guarding. But I want you to think about something. I want you to think about that specific accident and the story that I told you. This guy had several years working around conveyors. He knew the hazards. And he got that pitch point or got that push broom, that hand broom stuck in that pinch point. And he wasn't able to drop that broom before his arm was pulled in. Why couldn't this worker drop that hand broom before it pulled him in? So we did some research that I want to show it to you here on this chart. This shows belt travel in relation to the human reaction time. So we've done some studies and we've tested on average different people's reaction time. And typically it's about 0.8 seconds, right? So I want you to focus in on this 0.8 seconds. Now the lines that you see in the different colors represent different belt speeds. If you don't know how fast your conveyors are running, you should find that information out. In most bulk material handling facilities, most belts are gonna run over 400 feet per minute, which is shown by that red line. It might be a little bit uncommon in the US for a mine or a process plant to operate a conveyor over a thousand feet per minute, which is represented by the black line. So you're probably somewhere between the red line and the black line on this chart. And if you're the average human, you've got a reaction time of about 0.8 seconds. Well, what this chart tells you is that how far the belt will travel considering its speed and your reaction time. So if you've got a belt traveling at 800 feet per minute and your reaction time is 0.8 seconds, and then you bring this over to your left, this shows you how far that belt will travel in seconds in the time it takes you to open your hand to drop a tool. And I think this is really, really important to share with your staff. I think we all think that if we get a tool stuck in a pinch point, we can quickly let go of it. But the fact is the brain and the body doesn't work that way. And when you convert your reaction time to the speed of your belts, you've got a lot of belt travel and the time it takes you to do this. All right, so a couple other things I wanted to share with you before we get rolling into the good stuff here is there was a study done by the US Bureau of Mines. Now, if you're not familiar with the US Bureau of Mines, um, it was an organization uh, as part of the Department of Interior from 1910 to uh, the mid-90s, um, and it disbanded in the mid-90s. But basically what the U.S. Bureau of Mines did is provide research uh, primarily used for MSHA as well as others in the mining industry. Now, the U.S. Bureau of Mines did a study over the course of four years. And during that four-year study, 
there were 459 injuries from belt conveyors. Of those 459 injuries, 13 resulted, unfortunately, in a fatality. 22 resulted in a permanent disability. The worker never worked again. One of the unique things about this study is when we look at the breakdown of activity on the right. And what this study found is that 42% of the workers who got injured were performing maintenance on the equipment. 39% of the people that got hurt, of these 459, 39% were cleaning up spilled material. So I just want you to think a little bit about that and how bulk material belt conveyors might have a little more danger than other types of equipment at your facility and thus would require a little more attention to guarding. A lot of the equipment that you're working with may not have the exposure to the workers that a belt conveyor might have. There's another study that I want to share with you, and this is a study that we did for our publication. And what we found in, in our conveyor accident study is that 24% of the injuries that we looked at happened at the tail pulley. 19% uh, happened at the return roller. 15% happened at the load zone. And 11% happened at the head pulley. So we broke this down on the left-hand side of your screen. What you're seeing is a breakdown of accidents in relation to where they happened at a conveyor belt. So you can see the most significant dangers of a conveyor belt, tail pulley number one, return rollers number two, followed by load zone, and then the head pulley. Now the remaining percentage of this is might be varying different things uh, that kind of all group together. On the right-hand side of the screen, what you're seeing is the activity that the worker was doing. So unfortunately, 6% were riding on a conveyor belt. 38% were cleaning around a conveyor belt. Again, one of those inherent dangers of belt conveyors. 25% were doing maintenance. 17% were unknown. And then again, 6% uh, were riding on the conveyor belt. All right, let's talk about some of these specific guarding strategies that you should really be taken into consideration if you wanna reduce the risk of injury, avoid those citations and attract and retain those workers. The first thing that I'm gonna to mention to you is that we wanna recommend that the guard not be a hazard itself. One of the most recordable injuries from MSHA consistently over the last 15 years is workers being hurt while trying to manipulate a guard. And it seems unreasonable that there's guarding that is actually hurting a worker. The guard's intended to protect the worker, but because that guard's not designed properly, it caused a back strain for the worker or pinched fingers and a pinch point in a door of a guard uh, or a cut laceration from sharp edges. So we don't want that guard itself to increase risk. We want it to reduce risk. So a couple of things when you're designing guards is one, you want to make sure it has handles. You want to make sure that that guard is easily handled by a worker like you see in this photograph. It should be banded or should have no sharp edges. You see a lot of guards using expanded metal. Those expanded metal, if it's not banded, well, then you've got a sharp edge that could cause a laceration. And you want to take into consideration the weight of the guard. Small panels that are easily handled, like you see in this photograph, that are 50 pounds or less, are really best practice as opposed to huge panels that are more difficult for a worker to handle. Okay, the other thing that you want to take a close look at when you're guarding a conveyor belt is you want to make sure that a worker cannot reach around, under, through, or over a guard. Now, over the guard... In the U.S., there's no specifics as to what that dimension is. Obviously, the taller, the lankier the worker, the bigger the guard has to be. But there's no real direction on what those dimensions are. Now, there are some global recommendations, and typically what they're saying globally is from the pinch point, that guard needs to be at least one meter in all directions from the pinch point. 
so a worker can't reach around or over. The photo that you see on the left was at a cement production facility, and they were really proud. They thought they were doing a great job with their guarding. And as I walked up these steps to go up to the next floor to take a look at some other conveyors, I had a guy snap this picture real quick for me. Great effort, great attempt, but it's not really doing anything to reduce the risk because a worker can very easily reach around that guard. Now, a lot of people will say, well, why would a worker do that? Well, I can't answer that for you. I don't know why a worker could do it. Maybe a guy would do it because he's trying to get a picture of it, right? What I did there, probably not a great practice. But if we really want to show these guys that we're concerned about their risk of injury, then we need to take the the responsibility to guard a conveyor in any instance. The photograph on the right, um, unfortunately, this is a picture that I took in the Midwest, and that is a picture of a tail pulley that was guarded. And uh, as I took this picture, I asked the group that was with me, what's going on here, gang? Why do we have this hole in the guard? And their response to me, unfortunately, was, well, Jared, we get material stuck in that tail pulley, so we have to reach in there to get that material on uh, out. And I obviously, they do that when the conveyor belts shut down, uh, but whether they lock it out, tag it out, and go through all those procedures, uh, that's really unknown. A better strategy in this would be to have a panel, small, able to move one worker um, with, with, with handles uh, that could get that. Okay, number three. The guard must be the proper distance from the hazard. Okay, this refers to the size of the opening in relationship to how far that guard is from the rotating piece of equipment or from the pinch point. Now, the photograph on your left, you see our friend Larry is checking this guard size, the, the size of the opening in the guard with a guard gauge. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as a gotcha stick. And, and that's something that you can get from ANSI. You can get them from sometimes your MSHA inspector. Um, if you do a class with us, we provide them in our live classes. Uh, but that's just an indicator that the opening in the guard might be too large or the guard might be too close to the pinch point. The tip of this guard gauge or gotcha stick is nowhere near the pinch point. So that guarding is acceptable when we're looking at it only through the lens of is it the proper distance from the hazard. The photograph on the right is an example of much larger openings in a guard that may or may not be satisfactory. There was a study done, um, can't remember his first name, but his last, his, uh, last name was Stover. And if you Google Stover machine guarding, uh, you can get a little more history on this. But uh, Mr. Dr. Stover, um, I think it was Snook, Dr. Stover Snook, if I recall, uh, worked for Liberty Mutual Insurance, and he's really the, he was considered the U.S. authority on ergonomics and how the ergonomics of tools related to reducing risk of injury. And this is the standard that Dr. Stover kind of released uh, back in the, I think it was released in the mid nineties. Now, since then it's never been revised and there's never been any governing authority that I know of that have adopted this. These are his standards in how far the guard should be depending on the opening. Now I can, I need to add to this, this was for all types of machine guarding. So this is the most stringent that you'll find anywhere in the world. It might be a little bit overkill for your facility. I think it's probably not going to be something that's open to inspection, uh, but it is one of the, the, the most stringent and the only thing that we could find where someone uh, has really looked at it and how it affects injuries. Number four, do guards require a tool to remove? Well, that kind of depends on where you're located on this earth and what industry you're in. In some industries, 
guards must be securely fastened. In other industries, guards require a tool to remove, right? So if you're in mining, uh, the guards do not require, I, we cannot find any law that says the guard must require a tool to remove. If you're in a process plant that's governed by OSHA, we can't find that. However, in, in other parts of the globe, it's pretty common that the guards do require a tool to remove. So I want you to focus in on these pictures. And uh, if you look at the picture on the left, that guard is secured by a hex type bolt that requires a tool to remove. The photograph on the right, they're using some retainer clips that without the zip ties, are securely fastened. However, they don't. They they would also require a tool to remove in this instance because they've added those zip ties on there as well. The other thing that this particular plant could do on the right hand side is in those retainer clips, they could run a bolt through that and then a nut on the opposite side of that bolt, tighten that down as well. So these retainer clips, satisfactory if you're concerned about making sure the guard is securely fastened. However, retainer clips without something a little bit more additional um, aren't going to satisfy the requirement of guards require a tool to remove should that be what you choose. Why do we require a tool to remove a guard really comes from the intent of the rule and that's what we've got to look at is why why is this intended the intent of this recommendation is to make that worker who's got one thing on their mind typically which is the task at hand stop and rethink that one thing that he's got on his mind so the intent of requiring a tool to remove the guard is going to force that worker who's got in some cases, for lack of a better description, kind of tunnel vision on what he's got to get done and slow that procedure up a little bit and get him to stop and think, hey, this is guarded for a reason. I've got to get a tool. What, you know, I need to rethink what I'm doing right now and recognize that I'm in a hazardous situation. Number five, let's talk a little bit about coloring of guards. If you look at the photograph on your left, that looks to be a piece of equipment that's well guarded. However, it's the same color as the equipment that it's guarding. Guards must stand out in color. It's like orange or yellow. It's kind of the universal color of danger. So guards don't necessarily have to be painted orange or yellow. They don't necessarily have to be high visibility colors. They must stand out in color. They must be a different color than the other equipment. Um, and that's what you see on the photograph on the right. You see a more high visibility color. Doesn't have to be, uh, but certainly great idea to have it be orange or yellow. Uh, but it must be a different color than the equipment that it's guarding. I want to show you the problem with yellow guards. Now, if you look at this photograph, this looks to be a pretty standard conveyor guard. You'll see this all over your facilities, probably. Typically, just expanded mellow, painted yellow, installed, doing its job. The problem with this is that it's very difficult for a maintenance person to see what's going on with the equipment because the yellow attracts the eye. And you can't see through the guard to the equipment to know what's going on. You can't do those visual inspections. I want to show you more of this picture here. Now, in this first part of the picture, you can barely tell what equipment is behind that guard. It is troughing rollers. When I show you the rest of the picture, it is crystal clear what equipment we're guarding. We can say very easily on the right-hand side of the picture that that's a troughing roll. We can probably even determine that it's 35-degree trough. We can see all the way to the other side. 
We can't see that on the left-hand side of the picture because that yellow is restricting our view. So they're painting the field of the guard black and then the band or the outside a more high visibility color. Great practice. Number six and the final recommendation that we have is we got to make sure guards are one, maintained, two, reinstalled. Your guarding strategy can be implemented and you can guard a conveyor belt with everything that we've talked about into great consideration. But if you're not inspecting those guards and changing them out as they get damaged, like you see in the photograph on the left, then you're, you've really not done much to protect your workers. The other concern is replacing those guards back before after the work or inspection might be done. Um, it doesn't take me very long to walk through a facility and get a picture like what I see on the right-hand side. So we got to make sure those guards are inspected and maintained, replaced when necessary, and that workers are trained to reinstall that guard properly once they've completed the work that they need to do. Uh, return roll guards should be guarded against the pinch point unless they're guarded by location. Now, guarded by location kind of depends on where you're at in the world and the industries that you work in. Sometimes it's any guard that's over seven foot in elevation. Some guards in, in some places of the world, it's eight foot in elevation. In some parts of the world, it's measured in meters. But um, you've got to make sure you know that. And if the guard is close or a, a worker could access it because it's not guarded by location, you've got to guard against the nip point of those return rolls. And that guard should have a maximum gap of about five millimeters or three sixteenths of an inch, both here and here. The other thing with return roll guards is any return roll guard over a roadway or a walkway should be guarded. If that roll were to fall unexpectedly, like you see in the photograph on the right, that guard, if it's that roller, if it's over a roadway or a walkway, that guard uh, should be caught. One more thing here on these return roll guards is these catch baskets over roadways and walkways can really pack with material and that can damage the belt through abrasion damage depending on what you're conveying if that material gets packed into those catch baskets that material can damage that rubber top cover of the belt through abrasion so you want to make sure that your belts are being cleaned properly or use what's called self cleaning baskets which hopefully allow any built up to fall through that's still not a great practice is to allow that material to fall through because um, you don't want falling material coming off that conveyor as well. However, the best thing that you can do if you have to use these catch baskets is to make sure those belts are cleaned properly. When we're done, I want you to go out to your facility, walk around and rethink some of these best practices that we've discussed today and take a more critical look at your guarding effort. And if there's some improvements to be made, make them. If you do that, you're gonna reduce the risk of injury to your workers. You're gonna reduce the consequences that come along with a fatality or an injury. And you're gonna be able to attract and retain that best and brightest workforce. Quick review here before we get out of here. Uh, there's multiple things to inspect, so I want you to keep those best practices in mind as you're inspecting that. Uh, don't forget, return rolls kind of need some special consideration. And don't over-focus on regulatory satisfaction. There's two objectives that we want to have when we're guarding. One is to satisfy that regulatory inspection, but two, it's to keep workers safe. And there's nothing wrong with going above and beyond what your governing authority might require of you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Appreciate you. Take care. Be safe.